Hello, and welcome back to AJC's Virtual Global Forum. Thank you for joining us today. My name is Tony Meyer, and I serve as chair of AJC's Global Board of Governors. For those of you who are new to AJC, Global Forum is the premier Jewish global advocacy event of the year. Though we wish we could be together in person, we're delighted to gather virtually to examine the critical issues facing the Jewish people and Israel. We're just about halfway through our conference. We've already seen so much evidence of how, together, the Middle East can be reimagined and a deeply divided America can be restored. There are still many more topics to cover and much more excitement in store. I've been involved with AJC for many years, following the legacy of my parents, who were also deeply committed to the organization. As co-chair of AJC Berlin, I've had the privilege of being part of AJC's advocacy with Germany, which, since the war, has become extraordinarily important for the Jewish people and Israel. AJC's early engagement with post-war Germany, which I have personally witnessed, has made a lasting impact. But Germany is only one example. More generally, AJC set out to become the leader in global Jewish diplomacy. That diplomacy not only includes engaging with friends, but also sounding the alarm to threats to Israel and the Jewish people. In today's plenary, during the famous Global Forum Great Debate segment, we'll discuss Iran. And trust me when I say this is one debate you will not want to miss, not one second of it. AJC is committed to seizing every opportunity to advance the well-being of the Jewish people and Israel, as we have had for decades. If you'd like to be part of this vital work, join us. Help us reimagine what's possible and visit AJC.org. Thank you once again for being with us today and enjoy the program. When I Google Orthodox Jews, none of the pictures that come up look like me. They're all of men dressed in black and white. I live my life in color, and I too am an Orthodox Jew. My name is Leslie Ginsberg Klein. I grew up in Chicago and graduated from an all girls Beis Yaakov Orthodox Jewish high school. I have a PhD in education and Jewish studies from NYU and I'm the Dean of an Orthodox Women's College in Baltimore. I'm currently writing a book about the history of Beis Yaakov, a movement for Orthodox girls education that was founded by a visionary woman named Sarah Schneer in Poland in 1917. She was a model of grassroots activism. She believed in empowering Jewish women through intellectual engagement with Judaism and by creating positive Jewish environments for them. I know firsthand about the importance of Jewish women's spaces. When I was living in New York, I founded an organization called Girls Night On, which hosts open mic nights for Jewish women. I knew Girls Night On would attract Orthodox women as the obvious audience, but I found that the event appealed to women across the Jewish spectrum and even to non-Jews. There was something incredible about Hasidic women in double head coverings and reform women in jeans, laughing together and cheering each other on. It was exhilarating to see how empowering the experience was for both the women on stage and in the audience, and to feel the power of Jewish women's voices. The unity I saw at the women's open mic nights is as old as the American Jewish community itself. One of my favorite topics to speak about is the colonial Jewish community in America. When the first groups of Jews arrived in New Amsterdam in 1654, they were only granted permission to stay provided they took care of their own poor. Their response was, of course, we were planning on doing that anyway. Because as the Talmud says, Kol Yisrael arevim zelazeh. All Jews are responsible for one another. That sense of arevas, responsibility, was part of our community at the beginning, and it is still so paramount today. 
Whether it is poverty, threats to Israel, or anti-Semitism around the world, now more than ever, the Jewish community needs to be there for one another across all religious, geographic, and political lines. I don't have a Jewish identity. Being Jewish is my identity. It informs every moment and every aspect of my life. I love my community, and I feel a powerful sense of responsibility for the Jewish people. I am a proud American Jew. It is my honor to join you today for the AJC's annual Global Forum. As you all gather to talk about developments in the region, I want to walk you through President Biden and Secretary Blinken's thinking on these issues. As you know, after the ceasefire was secured with strong support from President B uh, Biden, he asked the Secretary to travel to the Middle East, and I accompanied him on that trip. During the trip, Secretary Blinken focused on four areas. First, the trip was designed to demonstrate the United States' unwavering commitment to Israel's security. Second, we started work towards greater stability and the reduction of tensions in both the West Bank and Jerusalem. Third, we were focused on supporting the urgent humanitarian and reconstruction assistance requirements in Gaza. And fourth, we were focused on continuing to rebuild relate our relationships with the Palestinian people and the Palestinian Authority. As Secretary Blinken noted publicly during his trip, uh, in order to prevent a return to violence, it is absolutely essential that we use the space created by the ceasefire to address the larger set of underlying issues and challenges. So we have been hard at work moving forward on these four areas, which will help both Israel and we hope the Palestinian people to build back better. First, for Israel, our closest partner in the, in the region, this means we will stand firm in our commitment to her security, including through security assistance, especially replenishing the Iron Dome, and conversations have already begun between our governments on that issue. It also means strengthening all aspects of the U.S.-Israel partnership and opposing any efforts to isolate or delegitimize Israel in the United Nations or elsewhere. We will also continue to urge other countries to normalize their relations with Israel, and we will look for opportunities to expand cooperation among countries in the region. Secretary Blinken also took the opportunity of the trip to discuss with Israeli leaders our concerns about the intercommunal violence that erupted in Israel during the conflict. This remains a key issue to resolve and will take leadership at every level of society. Any lasting peace will also require tackling the very serious humanitarian situation in Gaza and starting to rebuild there at the same time that we've got to do a better job of ensuring that Hamas does not benefit from any international reconstruction assistance. So we've been working intensively with Israel, with the Palestinians, with the UN, and with regional partners on new mechanisms to deliver support to the people who need it the most while continuing to isolate Hamas. And the U.S. will be making a contribution of its own in this regard. We will be providing $5.5 million in immediate disaster assistance to Gaza and a little over $32 million to UNRWA's emergency humanitarian appeal. The United States is also taking steps, and we began on this trip, to re-engage with the Palestinian Authority. Uh, these must include expanding opportunities for Palestinians in Gaza and the West Bank, increasing private sector and trade and investment opportunities as well. To this end, we will also reopen our consulate in Jerusalem to allow us to better engage and to provide support to the Palestinian people. The Biden administration is also notifying Congress of our intent to provide an additional $75 million in development and economic assistance for the Palestinians in 2021, 
and we're consulting closely with the Israeli government on these issues as well. Uh, President Biden and Secretary Blinken have both stressed in public that the Palestinians and the Israelis each deserve to live safely and securely and to enjoy equal measures of freedom, opportunity, and democracy and to be treated with dignity. In the longer term, a two-state solution remains the very best way to ensure Israel's future as a democratic and Jewish state while also enabling the Palestinians to live in security and democracy in a viable state of their own. Another critical issue of importance to the Biden administration that came up on the trip is the fight against anti-Semitism. It is deeply concerning to all of us to see anti-Semitism on the rise in the United States and around the world over the last several years. As President Biden said, each of us must remain vigilant and speak out against the resurgent tide of anti-Semitism and other forms of bigotry and intolerance here at home and around the world. And we must confront these hate crimes and the dangerous lies that undergird them. As you know, the Biden administration has embraced the International Holocaust Remembrance Alliance's working definition of anti-Semitism, including its examples, as have previous administrations. Much work remains to be done, but with the support of organizations like the AJC, we can work towards a world that is filled less with hate and more with stability and peace. Thank you for the outstanding work you each do in support of the AJC and for the vital partnership that we have with each other. I wish you a successful forum at this crucial time. Welcome to the great debate, an always memorable feature of the AJC Global Forum. This year's debate will pit two seasoned experts with sharply different diplomatic approaches against each other on the central question of the most effective means to counter the Iranian nuclear threat, and indeed the multiple threats posed by Tehran to regional and global peace. To set the stage, in 2015, after two years of negotiations and a placeholding interim deal, the United States and five other world powers announced an agreement with the Islamic Republic of Iran to sharply limit its nuclear program, a program long suspected and later proven in smoking gun detail to have potential destabilizing military applications. In return for certain constraints on its program, Iran won relief from an array of economic and energy sanctions that the United States, the European Union, and the United Nations had imposed. A year after implementation in January 2016 of the so-called Joint Comprehensive Plan of Action, President Barack Obama and Vice President Joe Biden were out, and President Donald Trump and Vice President Mike Pence were in, and 16 months after that, the United States withdrew from the agreement, later reimposing the sanctions that had been lifted as part of the nuclear deal, and right up until they left office at the beginning of this year, adding further sanctions against Iran. What we'll be debating in this hour with Ambassador Gerard Arrault, the veteran French diplomat, and Michael Duran, a scholar with a US national security background, is whether President Biden, who took office in January after promising to return America to the nuclear deal and to seek a longer and stronger agreement, is on the right track or the wrong track in engaging Iran. We're conscious that we're conducting this debate in the wake of several rounds of negotiations in Vienna aimed at restoring the deal, with many details of Iranian constraints and U.S. sanctions relief not yet clear, and with the political ramifications in Washington and internationally still unfolding. But the key questions haven't changed. Is the Iran nuclear deal worth saving? Will it make the Middle East and the world safer? And if the deal falls short, of confronting the range of Iranian threats, can it be fixed? We'll begin our debate by asking each speaker to, to, to offer an opening statement of up to five minutes. We'll then allow up to two minutes of rebuttals, after which I'll pose a series of questions to the debaters who will have up to 90 seconds to respond. We'll conclude 
with one minute summations by each debater. Now let's begin with you, Ambassador Rowe. Thank you, Jason. Um, I want to set some basic principles uh, to explain the problem that we are facing and the way we have tried to handle it. The first one is very clearly, we don't trust the Iranians. There is not a question of trusting the Iranians. It's a question of being able to monitor their program, to limit their program. And actually the deal uh, which had been agreed in 2015 was setting an unprecedented set of limitation and control of the Iran nuclear deal. Never in the history we set such an agreement of arms control, which was so uh, uh, strict, uh, really uh, at the expense, of course, of a country. The second element I would want to insist is that an agreement is a compromise. Uh, of course, we would have preferred to reach an agreement much more stringent. We would have preferred, for instance, to impose on the Iranians giving up enrichment. But an agreement, I, I, I said, is, an, is a compromise. And at the end of the day, you have to reach a point where you say, deal or no deal, what do you prefer? And we decided that we prefer to have, to have a deal. That's a very important point because, you know, I was, I have always, my, all my life I've been a negotiator. And usually when you come back home with an, with an agreement, you, you have always somebody saying, oh, that's not good. You should have asked that or that. Of course, I had asked that and that, but I didn't get it. So when somebody is saying this agreement is bad, the real question that you have to immediately to, to, to give is, uh, what else? What is your solution? And in this case, it's striking that we know what is the alternative uh, because it has been tried by the Trump administration. As Jason has explained, the Trump administration has denounced an agreement which has been signed by the United States of America and has imposed unprecedented sanctions at the expense of Iran. Really never such sanctions had been imposed on the country. What is the result three years later? The result is of course that Iran got out of uh, the nuclear deal and that today we are much closer to a nuclear bomb that we were in 2018. And sooner or later, we, are, we, we will have to answer the question Bombing Iran or the Iranian bomb? Because Iran, contrary to what the Trump administration was trying to, to get, Iran is not going to surrender. That's a fact. It is showing a resilience against all the sanctions and is moving forward to what we could think should, could be a nuclear weaponry. So the choice, the alternative is clear. Either we are able to limit the nuclear program, or if we don't, we will go to this alternative, bombing Iran or an Iranian bomb. Uh, third point, you know, the real problem in the region is not such so much the Iranian nuclear weaponry, but it's a, the geopolitical imbalance, which is the result of the stupid invasion of Iraq by the Americans. Iraq was balancing Iran. Now it's not anymore the case. So it's obvious that Iran is the big boy on the block, so we should balance Iran. And it means that we should complement the agreement with all a series of, of other agreements, and especially security guarantee to our friend, the Gulf monarchies. The Europeans were ready to work with the Trump administration on complementing the nuclear, era, the nuclear deal on the other issue, terrorism, regional activities, and the missile, missiles program. We are close to an agreement with the Trump administration, but as you know, suddenly President Trump decided to sweep away everything and, and to, to bring us uh, to, to this crisis. So to conclude, uh, this agreement is not perfect, but this agreement is the only means that we have to prevent Iran from becoming a nuclear power. And that's, of course, it's a critical result, not only for the region, for, but for, for the rest uh, of the world. Thank you very much. And I'm ready, of course, to answer to one question. Thank you. Thank you, Ambassador. Uh, Michael, uh, please, your opening statement. Uh, thank you, Jason. Uh, thanks to the AJC. And uh, thank you, Mr. Ambassador. Uh, what, let me start by asking, uh, uh, what are our two major goals with, 
uh, with respect to Iran. And they're number one, to prevent Iran from developing a nuclear weapon. And secondly, uh, to prevent Iran from threatening its neighbors through this uh, vast militia network that it has developed. The, the problem with the JCPOA is that it makes both of those goals impossible. Um, and it, it was uh, sold to us um, uh, on the basis of a number of false claims. The, 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 the most, uh, I think, um, obviously erroneous claim uh, was that it blocks all pathways to a nuclear weapon. That's simply not true. Um, it, it's an absolutely indefensible statement and it's easy to prove. And the, 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 the key issue is the sunsets. Within, about, within less than a decade, by 2031, all of the restrictions on the, nuclear, uh, on the Iranian nuclear program are going to be lifted. And so Iran is gonna have an industrial size uh, enrichment um, and reprocessing capability under a, a, an international guarantee. Um, so the best that could possibly be claimed about the JCPOA um, is that it gives us about a decade of, um, uh, of Iran not developing a nuclear weapon. Um, but if you look closely at the deal, you see that even that statement doesn't hold up uh, because the Iranian nuclear program is actually not restricted in any um, significant way. The, the Iranian nuclear weapons program is not restricted in any significant way by the JCPOA. The JCPOA has very strict limitations on a limited number of factors for a limited amount of time. Um, and it doesn't touch other factors that are very other elements of the nuclear weapons program that are very important. For example, the, again, the most obvious example is the Fordo facility, uh, the mountain bunker outside of Fordo, which we now know was part of a nuclear weapons program. We know that how? Because the Israelis stole from uh, Tehran the nuclear archive, which explained to us exactly how that was part of a nuclear weapons uh, program. The JCPOA, if it was going to give us insurance that Iran was never going to develop a nuclear weapon, should have destroyed the Fordo facility, but it, but it didn't do that. So uh, Iran has a number of other elements like this that it is able to continue to use um, uh, uh, under the, under the so-called restrictions of the JCPOA, which means that the, J that the nuclear weapons program has not gone away. And that, for that reason, the um, IAEA, the uh, uh, International Atomic Energy Association, has never uh, certified the, the Iranian nuclear program as peaceful. It's not a peaceful program and all restrictions on it are going to end in a very short period of time. And some of them are ending even before 2031. Now, secondly, the JCPOA is going to funnel to Iran billions and billions over the, over the life of the agreement, hundreds of billions of dollars, which it is going to use to strengthen its militia network all across the, um, all across the region. And uh, this is not a theory. We saw this happen uh, after the original JCPOA was signed. Iran's militia activity increased all around the region. It increased in Yemen. It increased in Iraq. Um, and Iran is developing, uh, uh, is developing ever better weaponry to distribute to these militias. Um, and we saw that just recently uh, in the conflict between Hamas and Israel, where, uh, where Hamas had a much, uh, uh, a, a much more sophisticated rocket and missile capability than it ever had before. Of course, Hezbollah has 150,000 rockets and missiles, which they are upgrading to precision guided weaponry. Uh, this, this capability of Iran's is going to grow stronger as a result of the JCPOA. So we are neither, we are, we are not going to stop the nuclear program and we are going to strengthen uh, Iran around the region. And so the goals that, uh, that, the ambassador, um, that the ambassador cited will not be achieved. They will actually be impeded by this agreement. Thank you. Thank you, Michael. Um, let me give you an opportunity to uh, to counter that, uh, Ambassador. Well, first, I, I think I I was expecting that Mike would tell us what else, what what is the alternative. As I have said, it's easy to criticize an agreement which is never perfect, but you have to really to say which other policy could be uh, could be conducted. 
Second point, frankly, it's false to say that in five, 10 years, all constraints will be lifted on the Iranian nuclear program. Because not only Iran is part of the, of, of the NPT, the Non-Proliferation Treaty, but it, it will have to sign what is called the additional protocol, which is giving additional uh, uh, powers of investigation to the International Agency for the Atomic Energy. And as you know, Mike, the, the intelligence services of France, Israel, the US and UK have been totally able to detect any move by the Iranians since 2003 uh, in, in, as their uh, nuclear program. So we will have the means, either intelligence, but also control to, to see what the Iranians are doing. And if they are really going back to a military program, we'll impose sanctions. You know, really, we will have exactly, we will be exactly in the same, uh, in the same situation. Second point, uh, the money you are referring to is Iranian money. That's not a detail. Third point, as I have said, the European countries, we are ready to work with the US on addressing what is called the other issues of concern, terrorism, regional activities, and the missiles. But the nuclear issue is such complicated, you know, an agreement of 159 pages that it should, it should be handled as such on its own merit, because we don't want to be to have to exchange ultra centrifuges against Yemen. So that's uh, that that was necessary first to solve this issue and then to go to the other ones. Michael, what about that? Your turn. Uh, thanks. Uh, so let let me start by saying the alternative. The alternative was the maximum pressure campaign by the Trump administration. Uh, the to say that it didn't work, as the ambassador has said. Um, is, uh, um, is simply not true. Uh, it was working extremely well. We, we have to realize, I think, that maximum pressure was only in place for about 18 months in it, to its full extent. The Trump administration tried, and I'd, I'd like to get to this later, but the Trump administration tried to get a longer and stronger agreement, the very thing that the Biden administration says it's going for, uh, during the first two years of the, um, of the administration. And, it, and the effort did not work. Uh, the allies didn't accept it. The Iranians weren't going to uh, accept it. The, the, the Democrats in Congress didn't support it either, really, when we're looking at it. Uh, so we only had about 18 months. And during that 18 months, there was unprecedented economic pain uh, uh, was put on Iran. Um, and the Israelis showed, especially, I assume it was the Israelis, an ability to go into any facility in Iran and, uh, and sabotage it. Uh, how much better could they do if the United States, the greatest power on earth, was, uh, was, was supporting them? So the claim that the ambassador made that the choice is between, uh, is between war or the JCPOA is simply not true. There is an alternative, which is uh, unprecedented economic pressure on them, as well as, as well as clandestine operations designed to impede the, uh, the program. Uh, let me just say one more thing. Um, uh, the NPT, the Iranians are in violation of the NPT now. The, the Iranians were in violation of the NPT when they concluded the JCPOA. The, the, the fact that they kept their nuclear archive was a violation of the NPT. So the idea that we're going to be protected by the NPT in 2031 is simply not credible. Michael, thank you. I think we can keep rebutting and rebutting, but let's, uh, let me move on to the next question, and then maybe you'll have a chance to, uh, to, to, to jump into, in, into uh, rebutting uh, previous arguments as well. Um, Michael, you just raised uh, the, the issue of, um, and, and Ambassador, you referred to it earlier as well, the effort in the early two years of the Trump administration to try to bring the Europeans on board an effort to, uh, to impose a wider agreement on Iran or to come to a wider agreement on Iran. Um, why couldn't, uh, Ambassador, why couldn't the four traditional allies, um, all equally aware of the multiple th threats that Iran poses to regional and global peace, why couldn't they come to a common approach to improve the 2015 agreement? But we were. <laughs> Actually, it's very strange because we were working with Secretary Tillerson and his negotiator, Brian Hook. And actually, we were very close to an agreement in May 2018. The only question remaining was uh, the length, the duration of the agreement. But we were looking for solutions. It's simply that overnight, uh, 
President Trump swept away everything. He was not even aware that there was a negotiation. My president, uh, Emmanuel Macron, called Trump and said, you know, we have a negotiation going on. The answer of Donald Trump was, which negotiation? And President Macron said, you know, conducted by Brian Hook. And, and President Trump said, who is Brian Hook? There was a negotiation. It was close. We were close to an agreement. You can ask the, the British, you can ask the Germans or the European Union. It's simply that in this dysfunctional administration, which was the Trump administration, everything, as I have said, was overnight, was swept away without any explanation given to the, uh, to the allies. We have solutions. We have proposals. We were getting close to an, uh, to, to an agreement. Uh, Michael, let me let me turn to you uh, with a, a different question. Um, President Biden and senior administration officials have said repeatedly, uh, as we've been discussing, that they, they they seek a longer and stronger follow-on agreement with Iran that would address a wide range of Iranian actions, in particular its ballistic, ballistic missile program, its regional aggression, its support for terrorism, as well as ensuring that the nuclear program restrictions don't phase out in a few years' time and that there are adequate inspections. Um, there, there, there are two dilemmas that I see. There's the dilemma of how you get to that follow-on agreement um, after sanctions are lifted, um, if that's what, what takes place in the Vienna negotiations that are going on. Um, and, and the second dilemma that I see, which is there are different agendas that the United States has with China and Russia and France and Germany and the UK. How can we, we, how can the United States convince our negotiating partners on our side of the table to go along with that tougher follow-on agreement? So the Iranian dilemma and also the, the allies dilemma, if, if you will. What do you think, Michael? Well, f first of all, I think it's important to understand what, what the JCPOA is and what it isn't. Uh, uh, Barack Obama sold it to the American people as a as an, uh, non-proliferation agreement, as a narrow arms control agreement. Uh, uh, Joe Biden has returned to those kind of claims. It was never that. As I, as, I, as I mentioned, it doesn't actually block the Iranian military program. It limits certain aspects of it for a limited amount of time. Uh, so what the JCPOA does do, however, is it moves the nuclear question off to one side to leave space for diplomatic engagement of Iran which the Barack Obama administration and now the Biden administration want to use in order to stabilize areas like Yemen, uh, uh, Iraq, Syria, and so forth. They actually see Iran as a partner. And this is important for understanding because the JCPOA was an instrument for turning Iran into a partner for stabilizing the region, a role that it can never possibly fulfill. Now, why do I, uh, all of this has to do with the longer and stronger agreement. The longer and stronger agreement is even a bigger con than the original JCPOA because the JCPOA gives Iran everything it ever wanted. So it takes away all incentive for the Iranians to, to agree to a longer and stronger agreement. If we go back to the JCPOA or something like it, there will never be a longer and stronger agreement. Ambassador Aro, do you see it the same way or do you have a different view? Can we get to follow on agreement that's longer and stronger? Oh, I, I'm stronger? really uh, first. First, uh, the JCPOA was not, uh, you know, intended to make Iran a partner. It, it was to handle the nuclear issue. And uh, I remember that we had the conversation with the Obama administration, uh, really basically to address the other issues. Uh, to rest, as I've said, uh, we are facing uh, the a geopolitical imbalance of the Middle East because of the destruction of Iraq by the Americans. And the Iran is the big boy on the block. That's foreign policy. We have to balance Iran. And that, you know, France has agreements with the United Arab Emirates. We have a military basis in the Arab, uh, in the Emirates, and we have a, a naval presence there. And I think that the, the Western powers should work together to reassure, uh, to reassure our partners. As a longer agreement, you know, I don't know whether, first, I don't even know whether it's possible to go back to the JCPOA, because if I were Iranian, I wouldn't trust the Americans anymore, especially because the, Republican in the Cong Republicans in the Congress are screaming that they will denounce the agreement in four years if they win the elections. So I guess that if I were Iranian, I would say, well, the best way is to get the bomb. 
basically, you know, look at Ukraine, look at Libya. They gave up the bomb and they were invaded. So let's have the bomb so we can face the Americans. Let me stick with you, Ambassador, and ask you a different question. Um, what, what makes you think that diplomacy can arrest Iran's progress toward military nuclear capability when we all know that since the days of the Shah even, the country has been intent on developing such capability. Um, it has a history of bloody conflict with at least some of its neighbors, and it has the homegrown knowledge and the resources to advance a weapons program. Is it conceivable that Iran would, would give that up? You can even add that Iran was aggressed by Iraq and was victim of WMD, uh, uh, chemical weapons, in the deafening silence uh, of, of the West. You know, diplomacy, it's not really calling for the good faith of the Iranians. Diplomacy is simply really convincing the Iranians that it's their interest, we are talking of interest, it's their national interest to reach an agreement because really pursuing their military nuclear program is so costly that it could endanger the regime. And the regime had reached apparently after 10 years, we have tried to get it 10 years to bring the Iranians 10 years to the table. Eventually they accepted to enter uh, a, a negotiation and to reach this, this compromise. Contrary to Mike, I think that it was a good, it was a good compromise, was limiting and monitoring uh, the, the nuclear program. It was the best that we, we could get, as I've said, it was, uh, it was uh, a compromise, but again, uh, verify. So it means that we don't trust the Iranians and we should keep not only the regime of nuclear, of, of uh, international is investi- uh, in- inspections, but also our, our own intelligence uh, means. And if the Iranians are moving towards a nuclear program, we should react. Sanctions first, we can bring back the sanctions. You know, you leave them, you can bring them back. Michael, really the same question to you. Is, is any negotiated agreement with the Iranians, given their interest and their history, uh, is it possible? So I agree with the ambassador about one thing, uh, and that is uh, that the job of the United States and its allies is to counter the the power of Iran, that Iran is, um, it does have in comparison to all of the uh, um, Arab allies of the United States um, and the Israelis, a unique set of um, uh, advantages in the in the co- geopolitical uh, competition. The JCPOA does not balance Iran. It actually takes American power and shifts it in the direction of Iran. It increases the power of the militia network across the region. It puts hundreds of billions of dollars into the uh, hands of the regime. It's it's very sad for me to sit here arguing like this um, opposite a French diplomat. Because when I was in the White House in 2006, the very best allies the United States had um, with regard to Iran were the French. The French were sometimes tougher than we were on the Iranian nuclear question. And what happened was that the JCPOA whipsawed the French and they were put in a position where they were angering both in trying to hold out against the, the ridiculous concessions of the JCPOA. They were, they were angering both Tehran and Washington simultaneously, and they were isolated. And so now we have a new French position. That's thanks to the JCPOA, which, which shifted American power, not just toward Iran, but destroyed the coalition that was balancing, uh, that was balancing Iran. Ambassador, since your country was just discussed, I think you should have an opportunity to respond. No, you know, it's the JCPOA, we, would have, we, we the French, we would have preferred to have some parts of it tougher. Uh, it's an open secret that we didn't consider that the negotiation methods uh, of the Secretary of State was the best way to get the best agreement. But at the end of the day, when looking at the text, at the final text, we said, it's okay, uh, it's, it's a good agreement. Uh, it could have been better on the margins, but that's, that's a good agreement. I insist on that because again, and I uh, really, I, I disagree with Mike on that. Uh, the, the, the Iranians are not going to surrender because what the Americans, what the Trump administration was asking the, Iran was basically to surrender. There were 12 demands and the addition of the 12 demands was surrendering. 
the Iranian, the Iranian regime has shown an incredible resilience. Of course, the sanctions are very punitive, but Iranians, the Iranian people are suffering, are suffering a lot, but the regime has not shown any, any inclination actually to cave in. And the opposite, they have moved forward. And as I've said, it's a fact. They are closer to the board now than they were in 2018. And they're going to get closer and closer. You know, they went to enrichment at 60%. What are we going to do in six months or one year? Thank you, Ambassador. Uh, Michael, let me come back to you. Um, a different case, um, North Korea, um, reported to have dozens of nuclear warheads, intercontinental ballistic missiles that could reach the United States. It periodically tests uh, ballistic missiles that could strike US allies and US personnel in South Korea and Japan. It's carried out assassinations abroad, abductions in other countries as well. And it's among the most oppressive regimes on earth. What is the rationale for the United States seeming to focus more attention on the multiple threats posed by Iran than one on the threats that are posed by North Korea, the so-called hermit kingdom? Well, I don't know how to measure that and say that there's more attention paid to Iran than on, than on North Korea. Uh, I think we pay, put a lot of attention on North Korea as well. But I think that North Korea should serve as a, as a lesson of the ghost of Christmas future of what happens if the United States does not, uh, does not actually block Iran, uh, both prevent it from getting a nuclear weapon, which as I said, the JCPOA does not do, and also address the militias that, is, that, it is, uh, um, that it has proliferated across the region and to which it is distributing precision guided weaponry. Uh, and what, what I mean by that is look at what North Korea can do. North Korea, the United States could destroy North Korea uh, in a relatively short order and, and wipe out its entire uh, nuclear arsenal. But there's a cost to that. And the cost is Seoul and Tokyo. Uh, so the, the, uh, the North Koreans have developed a credible enough threat against those two, those two capitals to prevent us from taking action against them. We're in danger of Iran uh, reaching that capacity. Iran, like uh, I said earlier, has 150,000 rockets and missiles in Lebanon through Hezbollah trained on Israel. You can see the capabilities it's building up in Hamas. Israel defeated Hamas roundly in 2014. Um, thanks to the Iranians, Hamas now has, uh, has more sophisticated weaponry. Israel has just defeated Hamas again. And we can assume that they're going to go to work, the Iranians, to give better capacity to, to Hamas. So what's going to happen is that Israel is going to get surrounded by militias who are going to get ever stronger with this precision guided weaponry. And they're going to train on uh, Tel Aviv like the North Koreans train on Seoul. And if we have behind that as well, a nuclear armed Iran, that is a disaster. Michael, thank you. I want to stay in the region now um, and, and, and turn back to you, Ambassador. Um, in 2013 and 2014, 2015, as the United States was coordinating with European allies on the negotiations that resulted in first the joint plan of action and then the joint comprehensive plan of action, Israel and America's strategic partners in the Gulf were routinely debriefed on the talks that were taking place with Iran. But those countries which have the most to lose from Iranian aggression and would be in the crosshairs of advanced Iranian weaponry weren't in the room when the deal was, went, went down. And they aren't in the room now either. Is, is that a formula for a more widely accepted deal this time around or, or, or the opposite of, of, of such a formula? No, I, as, I, as I, I, I said, I think, and I agree with Mike, uh, we are, I agree that Iran is uh, also uh, really raising a lot of problems. Uh, not only with missiles, with weapons, with terrorism, with regional activities in Syria. And we have to complement the uh, nuclear agreement with a wider agreement. And in this stage, in this case, I think we should work with the, the, countries, uh, the countries in the region. Because let's be frank, if we have the Saudis and the Emiratis at the table of nuclear uh, negotiations, they're not going to be uh, concerned by the nuclear uh, problem, but by the, the conventional problem. That's for them the, 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 re, the real threat. And, uh, and that's something that really, that's something we could uh, consider that the Obama administration has not addressed it after having signed the, uh, the, ag the agreement, the JCPOA. So let's look at the security arrangement in the region. Uh, 
why don't you could we couldn't we have a sort of NATO for for the for the regions with the participation of the Western powers? Uh, it's obvious that we have to stabilize it. In any case, you know the alliance. You know the enemy of my enemy is my friend. is is the basis of any foreign policy. The Israelis and the Emiratis and the Saudis have already concluded that they have to work together against Iran. So there is a sort of already a sort of balance. Well, thank you, Ambassador uh, Michael. Let, let's let's talk more about the Israeli uh, perspective on all of this. Um, it, now, as in 2015, the Israeli government has expressed sharp opposition to the JCPOA, which officials regard as offering a windfall to a regime that has expressed again and again its desire to annihilate Israel. Do you regard Israel's concerns as legitimate and are strong sentiments from so close an ally reason enough to alter the U.S. approach? They, they should be a very, uh, uh, of course they're legitimate. The, the JCPOA has, uh, has already served as the starting gun for a very, very dangerous arms race in, in, the, uh, in the region. None of the allies, not the Saudis, not the Israelis, not the Turks, believes that this is actually going to prevent Iran from getting a nuclear weapon. They are all looking at other alternatives so that they have um, that they will be able to meet the challenge coming from a uh, from a nuclear Iran. Um, it, we're, we're kidding ourselves. The only people that we have convinced that this is actually that this is blocking Iran or, or is the left wing of the Democratic Party. Those are the only people who are truly convinced. There are more supporters of the Iranian regime in Washington, D.C. than there are in Iran. The uh, the you know, the the Shiwa Shiwe Wang, the the. Um, um, graduate student from Princeton who was taken hostage by the Iranians, by the way, immediately after the JCPOA, when the new flowering of cooperation between Tehran and Washington began, said that in his, in his 40 months in Iran, he never met a person who actually supported the, the, the regime. So we are strengthening this heinous regime. It's threatening our, um, it's threatening our, our, our allies, and we're not listening to them. And the reason for that is that we are really pulling back from the region. It's nice to hear the ambassador say we'll have a NATO and whatnot. But the whole goal of this exercise is to pull America back from the region. Well, Ambassador, you, you served in Israel. Um, I think it was your first posting as well as serving as ambassador. Um, what do you say to your Israeli friends who are concerned about, uh, about these developments in the United States reentering a, a pact that they regard as uh, so dangerous? No, first, of course, uh, it's totally legitimate uh, that Israel expresses its concerns. Uh, its security is directly at, at stake. And uh, I do remember I was in Israel uh, when uh, Armani Dejad was elected and was starting to use this, this horrendous rhetoric about Israel should be swept away from the world map or the world map. At the same time, I know very well Israel and I know very well also the security apparatus. And I'm sure, Jason, so do you, and Mike, and there is a lot, actually, of Israelis, which in private are telling you, you know, former head of the Mossad, I, I could give names, former head of the Mossad, specialist of nuclear energy uh, from the uh, Israeli uh, Nuclear Energy Agency, who are telling you that actually they consider that this agreement is not that bad that this agreement is the best one that, that they, could, they, they could get. And by the way, they are totally able to, de, to, deter Iran, to deter Iran. So it has been, obviously, and really it means Israel, I'm not discussing that, but it has been a line of Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu, but it's not a line which is unanimous in the Israeli uh, security, uh, Israeli security apparatus. But in, in any case, it's very important and that, that what the French we did to be totally transparent uh, uh, about what we are doing. Uh, and we have had a very good intelligence co cooperation uh, with Israel uh, on this issue. It's one of these examples where countries have exchanged hard intelligence, which, as you know, it's very rare. Um, I'm going to uh, conclude with a question to each of you. Um, and, and But let me begin by saying that although it was routinely denied, um, it was often speculated that the true aim of the Trump administration's maximum pressure campaign against Iran wasn't to force it back to the bargaining table, but to collapse the regime. Uh, Ambassador, 
to you, uh, isn't there a danger that removing the maximum pressure sanctions will have the opposite effect, that it will actually breathe new life into a dangerous regime? And Michael, to you, if regime change was or could be a possibility, what would give us confidence that new leadership in Tehran, after heavy outside pressure, would actually be less threatening than the current regime? Ambassador, for you? Yes. You know, when when Trump denounced the, uh, the, the agreement, uh, we asked our ambassadors in Tehran, because we have the advantage, uh, uh, really, for, for, for the Americans, we have the advantage of having an embassy there. What was their analysis of the situation? And really, the answer was, uh, actually, as Mike said, the regime is extremely unpopular. Uh, there were some Iranians saying, oh, good, Trump is right to twist the arms of this, of this horrendous, uh, horrendous regime. But at the same time, the second question was, OK, and if the regime collapses, what will happen? And unfortunately, the answer of our ambassadors was that there is no political force in Iran. There is no personality in Iran which could be an alternative, a democratic or peaceful alternative to the regime and the danger will be that actually the Pazara will take the, the power, that actually the regime could go, so could still be worse than, than, than it is. So that's, what, that's our an analysis. We are going to have uh, presidential elections in June, and the risk is actually to have a, a radical uh, elected, uh, which in a sense will make our conversation useless because it will mean that the Iranians have themselves decided they don't trust the Americans and have decided to go to the, they have decided to go to the bomb. And thank you, Ambassador. Michael, um, a question about the possibilities of uh, an alternative regime, uh, if that were even, if that could even be achieved. Um, I, I think that there's a consensus in American politics today that our policy on Iran should focus on behavior change and, and not regime change. Having said that, I think we can probably, um, uh, I agree with what the ambassador said, that um, they are not going to give up. But I, but I would say the following, they're not going to give up their military nuclear program, they ever. And they, they, have, they have taken so much pain in order to hold on to that military nuclear program, we should draw the proper, the proper conclusion. Now, Maximum pressure held out the possibility of putting them under absolutely enormous pressure where they had to make the decision between regime survival and their and their nuclear weapon. That's what we have to do. We have to put them before that dilemma. We know what it looks like when when governments give up nuclear programs. We've seen it in the past in South Africa, in Taiwan, in other countries. And this the picture that is coming out of Iran is not a government that has given that up. And, it, and in fact, it's been incredibly tenacious about it. So the choice between uh, the, the choice between us is either do everything we can to weaken them, to put them before a clear choice between survival and, and their nuclear program, or to ensure that if they do go no nuclear, they are as weak as possible and pay an absolutely, uh, the absolutely highest price for it, or we have to take military action. Those are the choices given the nature of this, of this regime. To pretend that if, we, that, that if we funnel hundreds of billions of dollars to it and negotiate with it, we're gonna get a better result is just defies all common sense. Thank you, Michael. Um, uh, we're not gonna move into um... Uh, into closing statements uh, by each of you. Uh, we'll, we'll, we'll give each one minute to, um, to make a, a final argument. Uh, and although, Michael, I think I've heard echoes of what that closing statement might be just now, uh, yeah. I, I, I would like you to, to, to try to sum it up in, in one minute. Oh, right. yes. Yeah. Starting, uh, starting with me. Yes, yeah, sorry. Starting with you. Starting with uh, you. Yes, you're right. You did hear you did hear closing. Um, uh, I mean, you did hear echoes of my closing statement. My closing statement is it's just common sense that we if we if we funnel hundreds of billions of dollars to this regime, while also reaching out to it and, and, and uh, insisting that our allies reach out to it to negotiate over places like Yemen, which the Biden administration is doing right now, we are only going to strengthen it. We are only going to encourage it to use its militia capacity in order to um, in order to inflict greater damage on our allies and to uh, uh, inflict greater uh, um, extract greater concessions from us. This is just common sense on the basis of the nature of what this regime of, of what this regime is. The 
the Biden policy and the Obama policy is appeasement, pure and simple. And the reason people appease regimes like uh, Iran is they don't want to face up to the very difficult dilemmas that exist. And they don't want to see the real hard options that we have. And they want to pretend that there's some easy way to get out or nice way to get out of this. Michael, thank you very much. Ambassador Rowe, your closing uh, argument. Well, thank you very much. No, first, uh, you know, really, uh, as I have already, uh, as I've already said, uh, and I think Mike has, has confirmed it, uh, really, uh, the, the the alternative to uh, negotiating with Iran. I, I really, I remind everybody that you negotiate with bad guys by definition. You don't negotiate with Norway. You negotiate with Iran. You negotiate with China. You negotiate with 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 Russia. Diplomacy is to talk to a bad guy. Uh, but I agree with Mike that if we don't have an agreement with the, the Iranians, it will mean that at the end of the day, we will face the moment where the, the Iranians have the bomb or are on the point of having the bomb. And if, as, which means the alternative of bombing Iran or the Iranian bomb. That's the debate. I'm not sure that the JCPOA will, pre will prevent this alternative, but this alternative is so horrendous that I think we have to do everything we can to avoid it. Ambassador Aro, thank you. Uh, Michael Duran, thank you. That concludes um, this year's great debate. Um, thank you, AJC Global Forum participants, for joining us for the great debate. And I'd like you to please stay with us for further Global Forum programming. Thank you. I became the CEO of AJC in 1990, and among the very first decisions that we had to make was to appoint a new director for our government and international relations program headquartered in Washington, but with a reach around the world. It wasn't an easy job to fill, but we ended up with more than 100 applications, some from extraordinarily well-qualified people. And I wondered in the process, how are we ever gonna make this decision? But then in reading through the applications, we noticed one in particular that kind of rose right to the top. The person's name was Jason Isaacson. At the time, he was the chief of staff to a very prominent US Senator. And he had spent years on the Hill, both on the House and Senate side, and had before that a career in journalism and communications, which was also extremely impressive. To make a long story short, we hired Jason in 1991 and we've never looked back. It was absolutely the right decision to make. Jason stepped into the job effortlessly, and for the last 30 years, he has led our efforts in so many respects in so many parts of the world, beginning with North Africa, beginning with the Middle East, including much of the Arab world, beginning with Asia, and especially his love of India, beginning with East Timor, and other, other countries that people might not often think about. But Jason would quietly and repeatedly travel to country after country. He took AJC's long-term approach to diplomacy. You build relationships, you build trust, you build friendships, uh, and that's exactly what he did. Jason has been an extraordinary colleague. And so as we mark his 30th anniversary at AJC, while hoping for many more years ahead, we want to take this opportunity during the AJC Global Forum to celebrate those first three decades and to also invite some of Jason's closest friends and partners in the political and diplomatic worlds, both here in the US and elsewhere, to share with you, our audience, some of the reasons why they admire Jason, uh, some of the fruits of their cooperation with Jason. So Jason, a happy 30th anniversary, and now let's hear from those political leaders and world leaders uh, about you and your first 30 years. Everybody knows that Dubai and the UAE have become a place of, 
a focal interest for the Jewish people. And that particularly follows the announcement of the Abraham Accords last year in August. When the announcement was made, one of the first people I reached out to was Jason. He was one of the first people I thought of because he is one of the people that have worked so hard for this outcome, an outcome in which one can really speak about regional peace integration, where we can really speak about Jews and Muslims seeing their relationship entirely differently and so positively. Jess and I, I just want to thank you for your work, your intelligence, your vision. You sought years before anybody else did, and you mentored and guided and helped our community. And we are the direct beneficiaries of your work. Thank you, Jason. Thank to you, your collaboration between AGC and the Jewish community of Morocco has been raised to an exceptional level since the signing of our partnership agreement. You understood the essence of the civilization of the Kingdom of Morocco, and from then on, you constantly support the role it could play for the establishment of a dialogue between the sons of Abraham and moreover for the advent of a just peace, sustainable in dignity and security for all. And the recent re-establishment of a diplomatic relation between the State of Israel and the Kingdom of Morocco is proof of the validity of your vision. You're eternal and you haven't changed a bit since I met you, I think, 18 years ago. Uh, you are a remarkable person. Uh, if David is the CEO, you are probably the political director of the Foreign Ministry of the Jewish People um, and you are doing an excellent job. And I, I'm very proud of you. I'm, I'm very proud of being your friend. Um, you have done so many things uh, for the State of Israel and uh, you represent all the good that we have uh, in the Jewish people. Uh, I wish you many more years of success. I'm looking forward to continue working with you. I'm thrilled uh, to wish you, Jason, happy anniversary. You've not only given so many years to the American Jewish Committee, but you've given so many years to all of us. You've helped us understand the world. You've helped us connect to people all over the world. You stand for all of the values that are important as Jews, as supporters of Israel, as Americans who care about making sure that we stand up for human rights, that we stand up for security, that we make sure that Israel is secure. But more than anything, Jason, I wanna say you've been a good friend to me, you've been a colleague, you've helped me provide information, wisdom, connection, and understanding. Even when we've disagreed, we are always thoughtful with each other, uh, filled with content and um, impact. And I know that you always, always only want the best for the American people, for the people of Israel, and for the world. So congratulations, celebrate in every way you possibly can. We are all so lucky that you're part of the American Jewish Committee. Sharing UNESCO's values and purpose, Jason Isaacson has worked tirelessly to promote education and dialogue as key elements for fighting anti-Semitism, breaking down prejudices, and fostering dialogue. His long-standing support to UNESCO has been deeply valued, particularly in championing our unique programs on education about the Holocaust and on addressing contemporary forms of anti-Semitism. His efforts to ensuring that each passing generation understands the mechanisms and consequences of anti-Semitism and discrimination in our societies in general are just as relevant and crucial today as they were 30 years ago. Dear Jason, on behalf of UNESCO and its uh, teams, we thank you and we look forward to continuing our work together. Dear Jason, congratulations on 30 years at AJC can't believe you actually completed 30 years at AJC. But ever since we've started working with AJC, it's always been through you and it's always been through your efforts. I can't imagine AJC without Jason. Hopefully we won't have to, but I just want to stress how important your role has been 
and how integral you've been at building the relationship between AJC and the UAE since the last 20 years I've been around. All the credit goes to you, and I just wanted to wish you congratulations on the 30 years you've been there. Looking forward to the next 30 years. Mother of Jason, on your 30th anniversary at AJC, I am privileged to have first met you in 2006 on one of your first trips to Bahrain. I've always enjoyed hosting you and your delegations each year for dinner at my home, where we discuss the opportunities for Jewish life here in the Gulf. This tradition continued even when I was in Washington, serving as Bahrain's ambassador. I cherish our friendship, which has grown through the years, and I'm immensely appreciative for all that you have done to help shape the conversation in Jewish-Muslim relations and to show the American Jewish community how comfortable, safe, and vibrant Jewish life is in the Gulf. You have left an indelible mark that generations to come will benefit from. L'chaim, and all the best as you continue this critical mission. Jason, my dear friend, from our first encounter in 2004, you have inspired me, countless Arabs and Muslims across the region through your steadfast dedication to peace and partnership. From our own work together, I know that you are a man of his word, a man of honor. In other words, I can only imagine the vast impact you have had over the past 30 years as you travel the region continuously, winning the trust of people and partnering with them so quietly and gently, always for the coming good. God bless you, Jason, my dear friend. May your next 30 years of tireless effort bring untold benefits to our children and grandchildren and eternal comfort to the ancestors we share. Greetings to the members and friends of the American Jewish Committee. I am delighted to address to you this message of friendship and peace on behalf of the Kingdom of Morocco. Our long-standing relationship of dialogue and exchange with your organization has significantly deepened over the decades and is forged in mutual respect. We look forward to building that relationship to new heights and continuing to work together to expand opportunities for our Moroccan-American partnership for Muslim-Jewish understanding and now, in light of the normalization agreements, for expanded cooperation with Israel. Through the numerous visits AJC members have paid to my country, your organization has witnessed firsthand Morocco's long-standing commitment to honor its Jewish heritage, spearheaded by His Majesty the King, in keeping with the legacy perpetuated by his forefathers. This is reflected through numerous initiatives preserving religious sites but also promoting education and building bridges of understanding on the basis of Morocco's proud tradition of religious and ethnic diversity. Of course, as Ambassador of the Kingdom of Morocco to the United States, my focus is on increasing awareness and appreciation in both our countries of the many possibilities that lie before us and of the historic alliance that binds us, an alliance over two centuries old that predates the U.S. Constitution. I am also privileged to represent my country in its strategic partnership with the United States, collaborating across a range of sectors from renewable energy to counterterrorism, from educational exchange to investments, and from public health to, it, to the advancement of the Middle East peace. A peace based on a two-state solution which benefits all the people of the region and fully safeguards sites wholly to all the children of Abraham. In all these areas, 
and especially when it comes to Morocco's security and the recognition of our sovereignty over historic Moroccan lands in our southern provinces, our embassy in Washington and I personally look forward to extending the ongoing bonds of friendship and support that we enjoy with the American Jewish community. Allow me to conclude by taking this opportunity to extend a special word of thanks to the leadership of the AJC, in particular its president, Ms. Harriet Schleifer, its CEO, Mr. David Harris, and, and last but not least, the chief policy officer, Mr. Jason Isaacson, for their firm commitment to the Moroccan-American Alliance based on our shared values and commitment to peace. Thank you. I am thankful to the AJC for the invitation to address the AJC 2021 Annual Forum. In the past few months, we initiated a dialogue that also involved some members of the Sudanese-American communities and agreed to further strengthen relations between Sudan and the U.S. and the Jewish-American communities. This goes in line with the significant change brought in by the December 2018 revolution in Sudan that initiated a democratization process based on the principles of freedom, peace, and justice, a process uh, which opened vast opportunities for Sudan, normalizing its relations with the international community and opening up opportunities for peace and development. But it is also a process fraught with many challenges, not least among which is putting an end to the wars that have been raging in parts of the country for many years, reconciling the society with itself and resolving the tremendous social and economic challenges. Foremost among the normalization process, processes is the one with the United States, which has seen removing Sudan from the list of countries sponsoring or harboring terrorism and resuming normal dip dip diplomatic and economic relations with the U.S. Sudan equally engaged in a review of its regional relations, putting an end to the negative legacy of the past regime and opening up opportunities for peace, stability, and mutual understanding based on the principles of equity, inter interdependence, and solidarity of the humankind. So Sudan has taken the courageous step of signing an MOU that opened the door for Sudan to join the Abraham Accords and took a decision to put an end to the embargo imposed against the State of Israel since 1959. From a Sudanese perspective, this was done with the understanding to advance the cause of peace for all, stability, and equal rights in the Middle East. With this commitment in mind, we look forward to close cooperation with the AJC to achieve these common goals. Thank you for your attention.